just set up his part. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and speak with you tonight. It's nice to be in a group of uh, engineers, being an engineer from the very beginning. I thought I might start with my very first research project that I started off with, which was fractal analysis of the extraction process, but I decided that might be a little too uh, boring for the evening, so I thought I would go back and talk a little bit about what's the development of the oil and gas industry, and in particular focus on the oil sands tonight. That's the topic that we have and with uh, Dr. Mile after, uh, after me talking about some of the aspects that we're working to make sure that we are taking into consideration as an industry. So let me go through that and I'd be happy to answer questions once we get to that point. What I'd like to start with is just the context for how much energy is used around the world today. And if you can see from this chart, we're looking at kind of a projection of where the energy mix is going over time. And starting with coal at the bottom, then oil in the middle, and the yellow, and then natural gas, and hydro, and nuclear, and renewables as we get further to the top. And you can see that there's a massive growth in some of those areas, starting from a very small base, in particular renewables and others. But as you look out there, there is in the mix a change in that mix, and we clearly recognize that that is happening. In fact, in some areas it's happening faster than other areas. But the interesting part I want to talk about tonight is really that yellow section on the oil side. So we'll boil it down to that. And even in a flat, relatively flat, it's a small growth area around the world, we're seeing that there's a lot of declines that are happening in other areas. And yet Canada sits there with a very large resource that is attracting significant global attention as we look at the developments. In fact, if you take back and look at it, we actually have the third largest resource of oil in the world. Now, up until a little while ago, we were second largest resource, but then President Chavez decided he was going to add some more to their resource to move them up to number two. So we'll see whether or not that sticks. We go by the, glo the global resource that's out there, and we can see that there's about 175 billion barrels here in Canada, of which about 169 or 170 of that is actually in the oil sands. And so it really does provide a global interest in looking at. In fact, one of the things I look at, if you're looking around the world at that resource, about 80% of that resource is in, as you can see from the countries here, kingdoms or places where there's not private investment allowed to move into. So we only have about a fifth or 20% of that where you can actually have private investment. And of that 20% where you can see all of the companies in the world investing in, half of that exists in the oil sands. So one out of every two of their opportunities that they're looking at is here in Canada's oil sands. A very, very significant global resource. Now. There's two ways to develop this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but there is the 80% of the oil sands that is really too deep to mine. We actually get a lot of attention on the 20% where the first development started on the mining side, which you can see on the left-hand side here. I guess it's your right-hand side. And that's where 20% of that resource is. And so there's big, large mining equipment that goes through an extraction process that takes the oil out of the sand and then puts the sand back into the mine and covers it back up and reclaims it. But it does take a long period of time, and they are very large mining operations. Again, a lot of mining that technology goes into that, but it is of still a very large impact. On the other side, because it's too deep to mine, and so you've got about a range of about 70 meters, or if my conversion's right, about 200 feet. If it gets deeper than that, then it's too deep to mine. And therefore, people will be developing using long horizontal wells that are deep underground and injecting steam to warm up the heavy oil and get it to be able to flow back up to the surface. And that, of course, takes energy. And that's one of the environmental impacts that I'll come back and talk about into the future. Every year we go out to our membership and we look at all of the projects that are proposed and what's going to happen to the development of not only the conventional resource on the bottom of this chart, but what's going to happen in the oil sands. And you can see kind of two lines in the oil sands, kind of the darker gray. Up until about 2017, because the oil sands has so much momentum, those projects are really already started in the phase of building. It takes quite a long time to go through the regulatory process as well as to go through the construction process before you actually get your first drop of oil out of these projects. Very large, significant momentum. And likewise, once they're up and running, even when prices go down or back up, as we know it's volatile in the oil market, those projects continue to produce through that because they have so much sunk capital that's in there. And so you can see momentum in the projects that are already uh, operating up to about 2015 or 16, and then the new projects that are in the, process are the, the growth projects that are going forward after that. And of course, on top is the Atlantic Canada offshore. So once we have that oil, where does it go? Well, this is just a map 
that shows where the pipeline infrastructure currently exists today and where the dotted lines show the proposed pipelines. Uh, as was mentioned at the very beginning, Keystone is one of those dotted lines. We're looking into the west coast, we're looking into the east. But I wanted to really kind of put it in this perspective. This is where we consume oil in North America. And what I've shown here is what's in red comes from Canada. What's in blue comes from the United States. I'm not trying to pick colors, but... And what's in green comes from other markets around the world. And I think there's three things that I wanted to point out in this. First off, take a look at kind of the Ontario-Quebec market. Only about 40% of that is currently served by Canada. A little bit, when you add in the Atlantic Canada offshore, it gets us closer to 50%, not quite there. But then half of that oil, in fact, anything that's relatively east of Ontario is coming in from offshore except for what comes in from Atlantic Canada. We also look out in Atlantic Canada, again, they're supplying some of their own needs, but again, a lot of that is being imported right now. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not there can be extensions that go out from Western to Eastern Canada. In fact, that little gray line that goes from Sarnia here in Ontario out to Montreal, as some of you will probably remember, it was built back in the 70s to actually go in that direction. And then it was reversed, and it's going in the other direction to bring oil in from offshore. And now there's an application before the National Energy Board to turn those pumps around again, don't have to do anything with the pipe, the pipe stays the same place, and pump it back out in an easterly direction. And move it into the refineries that are out in Montreal and potentially beyond. So Eastern Canada is a significant opportunity for this, content, uh, this kind of Canadian expansion of oil that goes across the country. But likewise, if I go back to this one, you can see that the biggest market in all of North America is the Gulf Coast in the United States. In fact, there you can see there's just a little tiny wedge that comes from Canada currently, and yet a lot of that comes from offshore, even though the U.S. provides about a quarter of its own refining capacity, or its own supply into that market. The real opportunity for Canada is, of that big green part in the Gulf Coast, most of that refining capacity takes heavy oil. They were built to take oil from Venezuela and from Mexico and from other places around the world. And those types of oil have now gone into decline. Mexico has hit its natural decline, so it's starting to go down because of that. And Venezuela, it's not, they've got lots of oil, as you saw their number two. They've actually, for political reasons, chosen to move out of the U.S. market. So it leaves these refineries with the heavy oil processing capacity empty looking for heavy oil. And they look around the world, and where's the best place to get that heavy oil? Well, they look up to the growth that's coming out of the oil sands in Canada, and thus, not only the Keystone Pipeline, but the Enbridge Pipeline, the BP reversals, all of those are trying to actually marry the heavy supply together with the demand that's already built in that part of the country, and bring it together. Of course, we always want to be looking at growing markets as well. North America is a relatively flat market, and the growing markets, of course, are in mostly in Asia, but also in India. And that's why there's been a big discussion about potentially moving out to the western part of the country. There's already a small amount of pipeline capacity that goes out through Vancouver. But of course, you've heard discussions about proposals to move larger amounts through the pipelines that are there. I just wanted to show this one. This is an example of the U.S., but it can apply to Canada as well. What we've seen is in a relatively flat market in the U.S. for oil, so we're not consuming more oil across the United States. We've seen these other three countries drop down. Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Mexico. All for different reasons, and that has left an opportunity for Canada to fill the void that's left behind, even in a flat market. And so we see the opportunity for Canada to continue to do that. We can only do that, though, if we meet the environmental foundation on which this can be developed over many, many years. These projects that are being developed last in short term, 20 to 25 years, in long term, 50 to 75 years. And in order to do that, you need an environmentally sustainable future to be able to actually achieve the ability to actually meet the markets I talked about before. So, first off, the one that's discussed most internationally and has had a lot of discussion on policy is what are we doing with greenhouse gas emissions? But you can see, and I think you probably know this, that Canada's greenhouse gas footprint in the world is about 2% of global emissions. And of Canada's global emissions, you can see on the right-hand side, that, uh, it's hard to come up on the screen, the oil sands makes up about 6.5%. In fact, the new data just came out last week, that's now 6.9%, or almost 7% of the total Canadian emissions comes out of the oil sands. And so while we're growing it, we need to find technologies that improve the efficiency so that we can keep that number from growing and ensure that we're going forward in a responsible manner. If you look at all the different oils that come into North America, including what we produce here and what's coming out of the oil sands, you can see a footprint on carbon dioxide that goes across this chart. And it ranges what comes from Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Venezuela, all the way over to the weighted average on oil sands, and some of the oil, heavy oil that comes out of California. 
And that gives you a picture of what our challenge is, is to drive that piece down on the oil sands from 107 down closer to the average that comes from the others. And then you're talking about whether I use oil or another substance rather than what type of oil should I use. And I'll talk about some of those technologies in a moment. We have been successful in driving that down through technology to this point from about 1990 till now. So over a 20 year period, it's not instant. We've been able to move that down by about 26% at this point. And that's been mostly through energy efficiency mechanisms, using less energy in to get the energy that needs to come out of this. But also there's things being looked at like carbon capture and storage. That works in some of the areas of the oil sands, like the upgraders and refiners, better than it does in other areas, because you need an economy of scale to be able to capture that carbon dioxide. And it's not a matter necessarily of just cost associated with that. What we found in some of the areas, if you're actually capturing a very diffuse, kind of out of the stack form of carbon dioxide, and then you've got to separate it from the nitrogen, you've got to recompress it, put it into a pipeline and move it over to where you can inject it underground, not only was that costly, but it was actually generating as much or more CO2 than you were actually capturing. And so that's the technology we are driving ahead to try and perfect, and looking for all kinds of ideas globally to be able to do that. We also have in the case of the oil sands in the province right now, a carbon price. We have a mandatory reduction of 12% that applies to all of the oil sands developments if they're large emitters, which most of them are. And they must reduce by 12%, or if not, they have to pay a $12, uh, $15 a ton carbon price. This just shows the carbon price in Europe, one of the other markets that's out there for carbon. And it shows that it's about in the same range as to what other global prices are out there. Ours is a fixed price, and so it may go up if the governments decide on the policy that that's what they need to do. But it does show you that if you have a market price in Europe and what we have here, it is not going without that incentive to drive the carbon dioxide out of the, out of the emissions going forward. And I wanted to kind of show this on the carbon dioxide side. So you can see that the oil sands is the blue circle. You can see Alberta uses still quite a bit of coal for its generation of electricity, although you've moved here in Ontario down a bit, it's moved down in there, and very much like Western Canada is endowed with a great deal of natural resources of oil and natural gas, Eastern Canada is endowed with a great resource of hydroelectric power. And that allows them not to be able to use as much of the coal side of things, especially as you go further. But if you compare it to what's going on in the United States, we see a really huge opportunity. If we can develop technology that works, either carbon capture and storage, or using natural gas or other forms of energy on the power side of things, there is a very large market for that technology across North America. And so it's not just doing it for ourselves, we have an opportunity to be able to share that, and I don't even have this for the developing countries where that opportunity can even be bigger. So let me come back and talk a little bit more about the other environmental responsibilities that we think as an industry need to be foundational for this development. And Dr. Mile will talk more about this, so I will kind of give our perspective on it and let him uh, talk in detail as to what went on. Because there's been many studies out there that say you have to have not only the monitoring that's in place, but it must be transparent. We have to be able to see this. And so one of the key things that we did quite a while ago was on the air quality in the Fort McMurray region where the oil sands are being developed. There are now air quality monitoring sites that have been there for several years that you can go on the internet and type in the site. It's run by an independent group called Wabia, Wood Buffalo Environmental Association. And you can check what the air quality is in that region at the 15 different points today. You can look on the web and look at it. And that transparency has been extremely useful to show when there are things happening, when there aren't happening, but transparency has been very, very valuable. Other areas in the environment have not been as transparent as that. And part of the recommendations out of the studies that have been there, the Royal Society, the panels that looked at environmental monitoring said, we need to make sure that not only the correct data is being collected, but it needs to be transparent. And the industry has supported that and is moving in that direction. As you've seen, the latest government announcement that came out of some of the proposals that were put forward takes the amount of monitoring up from 80 to about 172 sites. But it's not just the quantity of monitoring that matters. It's also what you're measuring. So they're adding substances, a greater degree of frequency in sampling, a greater degree of sensitivity so you can get down to the lower levels of what's going on there. That's being put in place starting this spring. It's a three-year program that's the joint federal and provincial governments working on. And it's being paid for by the industry because we know this foundation is important. As part of that, of course, they went and said, here's what we were monitoring before. So it wasn't like there was a void. This is what was being monitored. Here's the sites. Here's the Athabasca River, the number of sites that were being monitored on that. They said we need to enhance and increase that. So they're going from those 80 sites to 172 sites. Much more dense, much broader perspective that goes into that to give a bigger flavor on the regional aspect. But I must em emphasize that this is all regional monitoring done in addition to the individual project monitoring. So if I have a project ABC, 
I've got to actually, for compliance monitoring, measure all of the things, the water, the air, what I'm doing with the, the emissions that are coming out, and I must report that just on my project basis. But you have a number of projects. What this does is expand beyond the individual projects and look at the whole region. In addition to what they're doing there is you now can go on the internet, Alberta government's established this site, the environmental portal they call it, and they've said you can now go to this and look at it yourself and they will be publishing that information available for all of us to take a look at and make a, great, a much greater degree of transparency than had been there in the past. The data was always there, especially the compliance data, but you had to go and ask for it from the regulator, you had to dig the water area from here, the land area from there, and you had to go all over the place to dig it up. This will put it all available on the internet and in all in one place. Okay, so that's great. What's the government doing? Yeah, we talk a lot about that. What's the industry doing about this itself, though? We really are using technology as the key to not only producing the resource that I talked about, but for here, it's providing that level of environmental sustainability that's going to be so critical for the future of this to be developed. Whether it be on the greenhouse gas side, in reducing temperatures, using new process new processes that are there, reducing the amount of steam, whatever it may be to try and actually reduce the amount of energy, not only is that cost efficient, but it also it reduces the environmental impact. And so technology is a real key critical factor to this. But it's not just air. Also on the water side of things, because we use water, it gets recycled over and over again. In fact, in some of the plants, in the mining plants, it's about 80% of that water is recycled. In the underground drilling plants, it's about 95% of that water gets recycled. And so we have to have a way to be able to make sure that that recycle rate can go up so that we're not drawing on the water that is in the ecosystem around us. In fact, on many of these deep drilling sites now, there's been a shift. Several of the new projects are going completely with underground saline water. They're not touching the lakes and the rivers on the surface. Since they're drilling down to get the oil anyway, they drill down below that oil and that's where those saline or saltwater aquifers exist. And they bring it up and use it over and over again for their steam operations. So operations there as well. And in particular, on the, you can see on the bottom one, making sure that there is a reclamation plan which has to be filed with the regulator, but that it actually is accelerated in what it does. It takes a long time in the northern part of the country to regrow these kinds of trees and the, the systems that were there. The reclamation plan says you must gather all of the plants and the um, trees and all of the berries that were in that natural resource before. You put it over in a nursery while you go ahead and do your uh, activity. And then when you're finished, you put the original dirt back, you put the stuff on top. It may not be exactly identical to what it is, but it's supposed to be an equivalent fashion. And you bring back then the same genetic material and put it back and get it planted and growing. It takes a long period of time. So they've shown now, you can see on the left-hand side, something that's been done, if you just let it continue with those natural processes, it takes a long time. On the right-hand side, they're now getting to the point where they can actually accelerate that by, believe it or not, some of the simple things is planting some of these seedlings in the wintertime. Before that, everybody thought things die in the winter, so you can't plant them. You only have that short summer season. Now they found a way that you can plant. The seedlings are dormant until the spring comes along, and it actually accelerates the reclamation process. There's a number of other things that are being done there to try and alleviate that concern. But one of the ones that's probably the most interesting to me, and I spent a lot of time working with this group, is we've now been able to bring together the oil sands operators to focus on dedicated innovation, but not just innovation to get more oil, like oil out of the ground. In fact, their sole purpose is innovation on environmental issues. It's called Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. It's just formed, and I'd rather be coming back and talking in a year or two from now and say, this is what they've done, because right now they've got some projects underway, but we don't have pure results. And so we really want to drive the acceleration. The companies are coming together. They're contributing all of their intellectual property together. This was a huge step change for our industry that is very competitive. And they recognized that it was, in, it was vital to them because environment is so foundational to the industry. And so they're coming, and the one that's probably the most advanced is the drier tailings technology. So you don't need the tailings ponds to try and dry it out as fast as you can. If company A is doing one technology and company B is doing another technology, which they were doing, they now bring that into this group and they actually share it license-free, no patents, so that the best of those technologies can be used by anybody in that group. Now, that's a pretty big step for many of these companies. And now we're reaching out to academics and we're reaching out to other service providers and others as well to join in and be part of that group. And that's tough too because as you know, Many people who create the patents are not going to want to donate this for free. They're going to want to get some value, but they can get some value by bringing it into this process, and they all contribute to this to get it over. 
and to try and make sure that it's being dealt with. So some challenges, but I think this group will be very effective, but I just want to inform you of it. I'm not saying that they are delivering results today. That is the full fundamental basis of this is to deliver those results over the next two to three years. Their four areas of focus are, in order, first tailings. Very visible, important, only the mining projects, but there's lots of technologies. In fact, I think there's seven or eight that are being developed individually that have all been brought together now. Second, water. Third, land. And fourth, of course, you must be working on greenhouse gas emission things. And so they've got groups that are established to start moving down in that direction. Again, all with that same, if you bring it in, it's shared with everybody philosophy. Last part I'd like to talk about before I end and sit down is what this means to the rest of us across Canada. It's really invaluable for me to come out and be able to talk here in Ontario, I've done it in Quebec and Atlantic Canada, because they are vital to the supply chain of making this happen all together. In fact, if you take a look at this as an industry, we're looking at about $55 billion for the oil and gas industry being invested here in Canada this year. And of that, about $21 billion in the revenue goes out to governments across the country, whether that be through taxes that are paid by suppliers here, whether it be through royalties that are paid in Western Canada, whether it be through income taxes that go through Ottawa, that's a very big stimulus that goes back into the government out of the industry. But really the one that I think is quite interesting is that the oil and gas industry makes up about a quarter of the total Toronto Stock Exchange. That's yours and well, sometimes we're not so happy on how it performs, but that's yours and mine pension plans that are invested in this. And if you have a pension or if you have investments that are involved in this, you are actually involved in what's going on in this oil and gas industry. In fact, if you look at it right now, oil is probably doing better than your natural gas parts of that, but we'll leave that up to the pension guys to figure out how to manage that. The other part of this is it really is a very large part of the exports that we have in Canada. Not only do we meet our own domestic needs, but it gives us an opportunity to export. You can see on the bottom that as you look at the commodity sellers across Canada, and so whether it be us or automobiles or forestry, or it really does become an important part of not only the Western Canadian, but also the Canadian industry. Let me explain how. First off, if you look out into the future, and we've had the Canadian Energy Research Institute look out 25 years and say, if you put the projects together that I showed you earlier, how much economic benefit is derived across the country? It's a very large number, just over $2 trillion. Now, that's over 25 years, and that includes all the benefits. It splits out the tax, it sees the labor market growing, but let me make it a little more personal. If you look at the development across the country, you can see where that amount of money is being distributed across the country, and you can see in particular in Ontario, Quebec, it's clearly the lion's share of everything that's outside of Alberta. So Alberta gets a big, big chunk of it, but once you look beyond that, that's where the rest of it is going to. So that's very interesting, but what does that really mean? I guarantee you can't read this from the front of the room rather than the back of the room. But what we did is we went up to our oil sands providers and simply said, give us the list of the names of the companies that are involved in Ontario and Quebec in this list in providing direct goods and services to your project. And they came back with a list of well over 260 in the first round and about 60 in Quebec that are completely involved directly in providing goods or services to the industry. So this isn't indirect and induced and everything that goes beyond that. These are where they are actually having direct contracts with it. So maybe some of you in the room are involved in that as well. But it really has then highlighted us because when we go in, we can say, you know, if you look around some of the areas and regions here in Ontario, here are the companies that are directly involved in this. Of course, they may have other businesses as well, but they, they are just... directly. It's the longest list on this European one came from actually Italy. And I knew it was from Germany and other places, but the pump and valve industry and the engineering industry in Italy is very much engaged in the development of this. So it's not just something that is localized. This is spreading very broadly. And finally, what does that mean for what we need here? Well, one of the biggest issues that we're working on now, as you saw the growth projections, is looking at the labor. And this is just simply looking at operating labor. So this is not construction, the EPC firms, anything else. If you're just looking at what we need for operating, so many of those will be engineers. This is on a base of 20,000 that we have today employed in the companies directly, again, not spin-off companies or supplier companies. We're actually going to need from that 20,000 this year alone another 3,000. And then the year after that, well, it drops down a bit because one of the big projects comes off, we're going to need 1,500 still. But over that period of 10 years, we're going to need 17 to 20,000, so almost doubling just the operating, not suppliers and APC kind of labor that goes into this. And this does not have to be just in Alberta or Western Canada. This is across the country. So that's critical for us. One of the key things that the industry learned last time when they went through kind of this growth phase is you don't have to build it all in one spot. One of the major pieces of equipment that was built for the CNRL Horizon project was their big apron feeder. It's a big conveyor system that takes the oil sands and puts it down from the trucks into the main thing. 
was actually built in New Brunswick, put on trains and trucks and moved across the country and just put together, assembled them. And they learned that that is a really valuable way of assuring quality, getting the best people to work on the projects and spreading this out across the country so you're not just working in one area. So with that, let me conclude by saying, we, when we look at the oil sands, we really do see three aspects of it. There's this whole element that I call energy security or energy mix, if you'd like to. We do see we're moving towards a lower carbon future. It's not instant, but it is moving into the future that way, and we recognize that we've got to drive down our environmental impact to do that. But it's not just for export. It's to meet Canadian needs here. And the opportunity, particularly in Atlantic Canada, has become very, very apparent over the last few months. Also, we know you can't do that if you don't have environmental responsibility. And so we're looking at that, and I'm sure you'll hear more from, our, from the next speaker, Dr. Ma uh, Mile, as we look at that, as to what needs to be done more, and the industry is pushing in that direction through technology, but also has others that are putting the information in front of us, saying you need to look at this and look at that, and the industry and governments are trying to make sure that that's as transparent and as robust as possible, because we know it's foundational. And then the last one is, of course, the economic growth and benefit is clearly spread across the country, if not across North America. As it comes to help us to develop this, we could not do this without the suppliers that feed into that process. So with that, let me conclude and I'll be happy to answer questions following Dr. Mile.